Hello and welcome to stage 15 of Misspoke, a cycling culture, cycling and culture podcast, specially produced during the coronavirus pandemic. And I'm going to start stage 15 with the next chapter in my novella about the Liège, best on Liège sportive, which is called The Monument. And if you want to read the whole story before you hear it on the podcast, you can get it from Amazon, either as a paperback or as a download for your Kindle. Anyway, we've now reached chapter 12. Clovis and Eric woke late, alone in their separate bedrooms, well rested after their hard riding day and night. The sun was streaming through the half-open curtains, but it looked cold and there were clouds forming in the morning sky. Clovis emerged first, wiping the sleep from his eyes and walked into the functional but bare kitchen. He found a kettle and filled it and searched the bare cupboards for a jar of coffee. There was a litre of milk in the fridge, a can of beer, a half-open packet of ham, four eggs and a peach-flavoured yoghurt. But of Jordan and Chrissy. There was no sign. Eric came in, in his boxer shorts, scratching his armpits. He looked exhausted. Good night, he said. They're not here, said Clovis. Who? Who do you think? Jordan and Chrissy. Unless they're in your bed. Are they in your bed, Eric? Chrissy was, said Eric. She's not now, unfortunately. I know she was, but she isn't now. Nope. You're making coffee? You don't seem surprised, said Clovis. I'm not. Two cracking birds like that, interested in a couple of old geezers like us. Too good to be true, wasn't it? That wasn't what you said yesterday. I was tired, said Eric, and horny. Mostly horny, I think. This isn't their house, said Clovis, is it? Why do you say that? Look around you. This is an Airbnb, pleasant but soulless. No personal stuff, no women's clothes in the cupboard. What's it mean? said Eric. I'm not sure, but if they wanted us out of our place, it worked. We'd better go back, see what's happened in our house. Can I have a shower first? I think you'd better. There was no note for them left on the kitchen table, no sign that two women had ever been in the house, other than the lingering smell of their perfume in the beds. There was no sign of them anywhere. The books on the shelves were mostly John Grisham and Lee Childs. The DVDs, the usual Airbnb collection of James Bond, Bridget Jones's diary and Disney films. The ornaments were anonymous and forgettable. The pictures on the walls were mountain scenes in the Alps. Animals, a whale leaping out of the water. It was a holiday let, no doubt about it, and much like the one they were staying in themselves. It wasn't far to their house and they walked back through the still deserted streets. It's not a coincidence they stayed there, said Clovis. They knew our address, and they booked that because it was nearby. And it was no coincidence we met them on the ride. They were probably watching us all the time. And them coming in the restaurant, they knew we were there. We've been fools. How could I be so naive? We got laid, said Eric. First time in ages for me. Well, I hope it was worth it. They're employees. It was their job to keep an eye on us and get us out of the way all evening and all of the night. They did a damn good job. But why? It was worth it, believe me. They don't trust us. Same with that blue Skoda. We've been followed since the beginning. If they're paying us ten grand, they want to make damn sure we go where we're supposed to go. Ah, so you believe me about the blue Skoda after all. And what about today? How do they know what we're doing today? Maybe they've got what they wanted and they're not watching us anymore. People like that don't just stop halfway through a job, said Clovis. Maybe it's not halfway, said Eric. Maybe the job's done. How can it be done? We're supposed to take something back, aren't we? That could be what we're supposed to think. Whereas in fact the job was to take something out of the country and we've done that. Take it out of the UK or take it into Belgium? Does it matter? Either way we've done it. Clever, said Clovis. Very clever. We don't look guilty going out because we think the job is to bring something back. And we don't look guilty going back because we haven't done anything wrong. Very clever. They walked into their house. The stonking red Mazda was parked outside. 
their bikes still in the hallway where they had left them. They looked at the bikes. They don't look any different, said Eric. Have they been moved? I can't tell, said Clovis. I was so tired yesterday we just left them here and went and got changed. I couldn't even remember which way they were pointing. Should we take the seat posts out? Have a look. What's the point? I'd rather not know, to be honest. If there's something there, we can't take it out. And if there isn't something there, it doesn't mean it isn't hidden somewhere else or hasn't already been removed. Better off not knowing. At least that way we won't look guilty. Well, let's lift them up at least. Check the weight. Feels about the same to me, said Clovis. What shall we do now? I'm having a leisurely breakfast with a lot of coffee. About ten, let's go and watch the pros race. Where shall we go? Stavlo, Cote de Stocco. Will they know? I expect so. I don't think we've done anything this weekend they don't know about. Make sure you tune in for stage 16 of Misspoke to find out about the further adventures of Clovis and Eric. And now we continue with my autobiographical memoir, My Life in Bikes. And for stage 15, we have a slight detour, which is called a disquisition on cycling computers, the tracks of my tears. I used to be a Garmin man. At first, I had a Garmin 500. It was pale blue, small, neat, functional, and it did what I wanted it to. Recorded speed, distance travelled, time, cadence, heart rate, elevation. Originally, it was attached to the stem with rubber bands, but then I obtained an out-front mount, which allowed it to stick out a couple of inches from the front of the handlebar and was much easier to read while cycling. As it was obviously ideal... Equally obviously, I had to get a better one. The Garmin 800 was basically the same, only dark blue and a bit bigger and had better maps. Although as I seldom used them, this was largely academic. I was happy with it, so naturally when a new model came out, I had to get that. The 510 was like the 500, similar in size, but it had a touch screen and nicer looking numbers. It looked more modern. However, it had a different operating system, which I struggled to use. There were only a couple of buttons, but they had to be pressed in a different sequence from the 500 and the 800 models, which annoyed me. So in a fit of pique, I sold it to my mate Bash, who had more patience and was willing to learn how to use it. And then a new bike computer came on the market. It was called a Wahoo Element. Don't ask me why the second E was missing. It just was. And the reviews said it was better than a Garmin. For a start, it wasn't programmed by pressing buttons on the unit, but by means of an app on your phone. And as the world now operated via an app, this was progress. So, naturally, I bought one. It was quite angular, with sharp edges, but I liked it, and it worked well. When a ride was finished, it automatically uploaded to Strava via Wi-Fi, and it looked good. It used a different mount from the Garmin, which was a pain, as I'd bought Garmin mounts for each of my bikes and now had loads of them. But there's no progress without pain, so I bore the pain stoically. And then in 2015, I went to the Liège Baston Liège Sportive in Belgium. A hundred miles and ten thousand feet of climbing through slush and snow and having to walk up La Redoute. I finished the ride and waited for the Wahoo to upload to Strava and waited and waited. It didn't work, and no mad pressing of buttons seemed to make any difference. A reboot was called for. I assumed my ride had been saved to the unit, so I performed the reboot and lost everything. I was heartbroken and fell into a deep pit of despair and rage. When I got back to England, I contacted Wiggle, from whom I had purchased the unit not long previously, and requested a refund, and it was clearly not fit for purpose. They declined. This sent me into an even deeper rage. So I said that if they didn't give me a refund, I would never purchase anything from them ever again. As I spent a lot of money at Wiggle, I thought that this threat would have an immediate result. It did. They said no. So now I was stuck with a wahoo which I wasn't happy with, but I had no alternative but to carry on using. And, to be fair, but for the occasional hiccup, It worked fine, 
although sometimes failed to find the Wi-Fi connection. However, obviously I couldn't manage with just one computer, and as I didn't want to put all my eggs in the Wahoo basket after my unfortunate experience, I bought a Garmin 1000. This was the top of the range model. It was the size of a paperback book and needed a special out front mount because the ordinary ones didn't fit. I undertook the Raid Alpine with Marmot Tours in 2016, Geneva to Antibes across some of the most iconic climbs of the Alps, including Lissarin, Lisoire and Col de Bonnet, and used the Garmin as a backup to the Wahoo. But the Garmin was useless. Some of the days were very long, and the battery would last for a maximum of eight hours, and often less. And it was so big it blocked out the view of the road ahead, and often the sun as well. So I sold it on eBay. But I didn't want to have only one computer, so I bought another Wahoo. Only this time it was the Element Bolt, a smaller, sleeker model with its own aerodynamic out-front mount that claimed to reduce drag by such a minuscule amount it could only be measured in the laboratory. But it looked cool. Unfortunately, all my myriad out-front Garmin mounts were now obsolete as the Wahoo didn't fit them, so I sold them all on eBay. Bike culling. Six bikes is excessive, anyone will tell you. It was time for a cull, but what to cull? The Van Nicholas was new, the Cervelo was my race bike, the Planet X was needed for winter, the Roberts was for going around the world, the Bianchi was beautiful, and the TT bike was already up for sale, but with no takers. A new company had recently started up, Road Cycle Exchange. We'll buy your bikes, they said, with none of that eBay hassle and bouncing checks, and we'll give you a good price. I contacted them, and they took the Bianchi and the Planet X TT and gave me a decent price. What was I doing? The TT bike was no loss, although it made a loss, but the Bianchi? I must have been out of my mind. Oh well, it was time to start reading magazines again. Does Julian buy a new bike? Well, what do you think? Tune in to stage 16 and find out where my bike collection went next. And now a word from my sponsor. Actually, I don't have a sponsor. So I thought for stage 15 of the Bespoke podcast, I would choose a saddlebag, which is made by a company called Speed Sleeve, which is S-P-W-D-S-L-E-V. What is this fashion for missing out the letter E? Anyway, the Speed Sleeve is a, well, what is it? Well, it's a saddlebag basically. And it secures with a couple of Velcro straps, but also it opens and closes with a Velcro strap. And it's a kind of loose, loose, floppy material. So it's not a rigid bag. Semi-rigid, I suppose, would be a better description. Anyway, the good thing about it, from my point of view, is that I can fit two tubes a CO2 inflator, a couple of tyre levers, some tubeless tyre anchovies or bacon strips, a... what else can I fit? A multi-tool, a tyre boot, and still secure the speed sleeve bag into a nice little package. Well, not too little, but a compact package which attaches nicely to the saddle rails of my bike so if you're looking for a new saddle bag you've tried lots of different ones as indeed I have then I suggest you have a look at speed sleeve because I've been very happy with it and now another of my highly affectionate cycling monologues and this one is called the Bianchi Lover So anyway, now I've got five Bianchis. Why not? They're gorgeous. Did you know they were the first Italian cycle brand? Probably the first anywhere. Iconic they are. I've got an Oltre, that's the road racer, and a Sempre, that's like a winter bike, and an Infinito, that's an endurance, all-day, sportive-type bike. Really comfortable. 
Not that I do sport teams, ha ha, of course. They're all celeste, that iconic Bianchi colour. Some people call it green or blue or turquoise, but it's not any of these. It's Bianchi celeste, and it's the perfect colour. Fausto Coppi rode a Bianchi, and so did Pantani. I've got the same version that he rode. Steel it is, not that I can climb like him. <laughs> There's something about Bianchi. They're different from other bikes. I've got celeste brake hoods and a celeste saddle bag and a pump and Celeste pedals, and I've got a Celeste Bianchi wool jersey. It's not original, it's a copy. I got it from Prenda Cyclisma. I look a right twat, to be honest with you. But who cares, it's iconic. They've just brought out a new one, not Prenda's Bianchi. It's called Specialissima, and it's like 12 grand. Full super record EPS, of course, and the logos, they're not stuck on, they're painted. You can't tell, of course, they don't look any different, but still, it's nice to have. I wonder if the wife would let me buy one. Of course, all my bikes have got Campeg. Well, you couldn't have Shimano, could you? That would be sacrilege. Chorus on the Ultra, Veloci on the Sempre, Athena on the Infinita. That's a fabulous bike. It has special inserts in the fork, which reduce vibration and road noise. I can't tell if I'm honest. I've always preferred Bianchi. He's never cared much for a Colnago. There's a Bianchi Owners Club, which I want to join. I can't imagine a giant owners club, can you? They organise events and stuff. They're used by Lotto Jumbo in the Peloton. Not my favourite team. They have their own brand for brakes and stuff. Reparto Corsa it is. No, I don't know what it means. I've always had Bianchis. They're iconic. I'm not sure what that means, but they are. I bought one for my wife. She loves it. Some people say that the Celeste colour is a bit girly, but I don't think that. I'll probably always have Bianchis. Is it Chi as in cheese or Key as in key? I'm still not sure. Who cares? I like those new black canyons. And now a little opinion piece about Strava. Can you be a cyclist and not be on Strava? Well, yes, of course you can. Can you be a cyclist and not be interested in Strava? Ah, well, that's a different question. So this little opinion piece is called Strava. Too many kudos. Strava, for anyone who's been in a coma, is a web-based app enabling you to record and upload rides from a Garmin or a smartphone using GPS coordinates, thus allowing you to compare and compete against other riders. You can create segments, specific routes or sections of road, for example hills, and if you ride it quicker you get a personal best. The fastest person gets KOM, King of the Mountain, or QOM, Queen of the Mountain, recognition. And if you pay a premium subscription, you can get age breakdowns and training plans and other benefits. Being internet-based, and the internet is a social medium, you can comment on other people's rides or give kudos, and thereby hangs a sting in the tail. Kudos is defined as honour, glory, acclaim, praise and honour received for an achievement. Having given kudos, you want it reciprocated, and having received it, you are honour-bound to give kudos in return. But when everything's an achievement... Nothing's an achievement. I did half an hour on the turbo. Kudos. I completed a club run. Kudos. I managed 11 and a half miles an hour. Kudos. I took a walk. Kudos. I rode to work. Kudos. I rode home from work. Kudos. I bimbled to Box Hill. Kudos. In the same way that all soldiers and policemen are now heroes, Every pedestrian cycle ride, every easy recovery spin, every spin class at David Lloyd is now garlanded with kudos, praising with faint damnation. And the true achievements, three times up Mont Vu to the Sanglé de Ventoux, completing Le Jog, a hundred miles in four hours, they're all levelled down. Kudos, mate. Chapeau. They gave me kudosh, I must give kudosh back. But if I don't return the kudosh, if I say, no, this isn't what kudosh should be, will I be cast out of the Strava community, a segment pariah, or even worse, join the Twitter group known as Strava Wankers? And I am so the guilty one. I finish a ride, get home, put the bike away, and sit at the computer in my damp shorts, plug in my wahoo, and wait for the data transfer. Agonisingly, 
I watched the cups emerge. A PB, a second, a third. I click on the leaderboard to check my age groups, my clubs, and then wait for the kudosh and the comments, basking like a shark in the warm glow of recognition. My best time this year, all time, in the club, in my age group, but wait. Why did he get kudosh from nine people, but I only got eight? Why did she give kudosh to him, but not me? Why did they comment on her ride, but not mine? Why didn't he give kudosh to me when I gave it to him? I have kudosh envy. The resentment overwhelms me. I formulate a plan. I will create a segment in a land not yet discovered that no one else knows and will never find. And I will ride it three times and be the best for evermore. My own private Idaho where my Strava followers will never follow. And I will reap all the kudosh, all the plaudits from unknown lonely people in South Australia and Singapore and Montana. And all the comments will be just for me and my hollow achievement. It's on Strava. It must be true. As you know, although this podcast is called Misspoke, and it is primarily about cycling culture, it is actually about cycling and culture. So occasionally something will sneak in to these little podcasts that isn't specifically cycling related. And this final piece is just such a one. It's called A Coronavirus Chronicle, and it's entitled Pigeon. I went for a walk with my daughter Rachel this evening. The weather was warm, but it was cloudy and grey. We followed our usual route, a circuit around the block, past our old house, still curious as to how it looks now, then past the post box, down the hill, and then turning right up to the main road. We passed an elderly couple walking in the road, the woman leaning on the man's arm, frail and holding a stick. The woman, not the man. It's still a main road and it was fairly busy. Maybe key workers heading home from work, it was hard to tell. A young man in a Porsche 911 roared past, a cap on his head, stubble on his chin. Was he a paramedic speeding home after a tough day? A junior doctor on his way to Farnborough Hospital? A supermarket shelf stacker on his way to a supermarket shelf stacking shift? Possibly, but somehow I doubted it. I suspect he was just a young man in a hurry, in a Porsche. We turned left at the traffic lights, just behind a man carrying two bags of shopping and a woman in a motorised wheelchair with a small dog tied to the handle. Another couple dawdled as their dog sniffed the pavement and cocked its leg at frightened bushes. I wish they'd keep walking, I said. This is a pain. Let's cross the road, said Rachel. A jogger was heading towards us, shorts flapping, headphones jiggling, but he veered into the road to avoid us, keeping his social distance. We passed a house with a book on the gatepost, presumably left as a gift for passers-by. Abandoned, read or unread, it was hard to tell, and the coronavirus still smeared on the cover. I looked closer. It was Chris Moyles' autobiography. If you had to choose one book to get rid of during a global pandemic, it might as well be that one. The golf course was closed with a tractor trailer parked across the entrance, preventing access to those who had no garden of their own. Incongruously, the water sprinklers still sprinkled, keeping the abandoned fairways pristine, green and deserted for when life returned to normal, if it ever would. They should open them up for people to walk on, I said. Bloody government, said Rachel. There was a path on either side, and we crisscrossed the road, avoiding other walkers, joggers and dogs. There's yoga, said Rachel. Yoga? That dog, and she pointed at a large, fluffy brown animal, walking beside a man who carried a plastic bag of shit in his hand. Mum says he likes a fuss, said Rachel. Oh, I said. The dog said Rachel. Not sure about the man. We walked on. Suddenly Rachel stopped. Look, she said. It was a pigeon 
on the ground, face down, propped on its beak. I think it's dead, said Rachel. She leaned closer. The pigeon wasn't moving. It must have just died, she said. What? I said, just like that. It fell out of the sky, dead, just like that. Weird. She lingered over the dead bird. I've never seen a pigeon lying on its stomach before, I said. It's a metaphor. It's like how coronavirus has come out of nowhere and landed on us. And here we all are, on our stomachs, with our beaks in the ground. Struck down by a killer we can't see, or hear, or smell, or taste, that worms its way into our bodies like a great pop song. All our dreams and plans flattened and gone. All our wasted technology. Our useless poetry fluttering in the breeze like broken wings. It's just a pigeon, Dad, she said. We walked on, up to the corner and turned left where a car was parked. It's lights on, a radio thrumming against the door and a man inside, sitting there, listening and waiting for the end of the world. What should we have for dinner, said Rachel. I'm hungry. You've been listening to stage 15 of Misspoke. A cycling culture, cycling and culture podcast during this period of the coronavirus pandemic. Make sure you tune in to stage 16 for more of the same and maybe something new. Good night. <laughs>